I am a half-bred being, a shattered spine mixture between my father, Lucifer himself, and my mother, his very own fallen angel. My blood is a concoction of his morning star redemption and her hurtling regret. My skin stretched like his holiest hubris. My eyes, the enchanting spark she once saw in him. My father wanted to play God, and my mother was just along for the ride, though it was a little more like frightening descent. She wanted to see the beauty of earth a little more clearly from where she was sitting, even though the heavens had the best seat in the house. Earth was nothing like she imagined. More tumbleweeds than garden, southern sun rays slit my mother's skin, and this was hell enough for her, but she, like my father, was now more demon than angel, so she settled and decided to rename hell home. The depiction of Lucifer is all a figment of the imagination. My father was once an angel who just wanted to be a savior, would dress in his Sunday best, suit, tie, gator shoes and all just to play ding dong ditch at God's door. My father never had a chance for downfall. My mother was always there to be his backspring. He gave her phantom wings just to paint a false picture of freedom stuffed jewels down her throat, the best that silence and submission could buy. In return, my mother tried to give my father a child that, she, that he could be proud of. Already the father of four failed demons, he wanted an angel to raise as his own. My brother was perfect for my father, and it was all that he wanted. When my brother was born dead, it became the coldest winter ever. Hell's flames froze, along with my father's dreams. I guess it's true when they say Satan's spawn will never get the chance to live. When my mother birthed me, pure and healthy, my father decided to give me to God. I was the repentance for his sins. I was too much of an angel to be raised by demons. My parents gave up their mortal games, wrote their apology letter on my tongue, force-fed scripture down my throat, stuck a halo in my mouth as teething ring. My father placed my mother and I upon God's doorstep and rung the doorbell one last time, left us as a gift in exchange for forgiveness. But I was always daddy's little girl. I could never be too much like an angel. I used scriptures as a toothpick after every meal of sins. Sometimes, when I look towards my mother, I see the shadow my father has left behind, how she is so lost without someone to follow. And in these moments, I let Job and Genesis slip between my teeth like a second language. I preach the Lord's gospel just to see her smile, regurgitate words as the Last Supper, and leave a 15% tip of praise at God's feet as a silent thank you. Hi. My name is Victoria Lee Smith. I am 16 years old and I currently attend Lakeside High School. I am a junior who took upon the often insane workload of not just four or five, but seven core-based classes. I hopefully one day would like to attend Stanford University upon a full-ride scholarship and double major in biochemistry and psychology to eventually become a psychologist and medical scientist who research, whose research focuses on the neurological treatment of eating disorders. I one day hope to be financially stable and help people and have a family. Yeah, that's me. I'm Victoria. Most of my peers and the adults in this community know me just as that. The one smart black girl in the back of class who's kind of quiet and kind of loud at the exact same time, so you don't really know if you like me. Come to think of it, you don't really know me at all except for the fact that I write a lot. And that's kind of my fault. So let me reintroduce myself the real way. Hi, I'm Victoria. But most people, well, my family, and for the remaining time that I grace this stage, I'd like to consider you all in the audience my family as well. They call me Vuku, V-O-O, 
KOO. I'm a 16-year-old junior who attends a cis, white, dominant public high school. When I'm in this space, I often feel lost and alone and insecure and not always safe. I'm battling and recovering from more than one mental illness, and I'm a little broken around the edges, <laughs> having come to terms with severe physical and mental trauma at the age of 13, and a little more than six months later, the passing of my father. I am one-third poet, one-third fairy, and one-third siren. I truly aspire to become an English professor at an Ivy League who emphasizes the powerful roots of healing and social change within writing. And despite the fact that I'm giving a highly professional TED Talk upon a highly professional platform and that I should be an expert in my field, I'm still revealing my scars and healing. Oh yeah, and like I said, I'm a poet. The poem that I performed at the beginning of this speech is actually called The Book of Redemption. It's the family story of my father, my mother, and I, spun in the extended metaphor and retelling of Lucifer's fall from heaven. I choose to take this piece to most of my performances, not because it is my best piece, but because it's a piece of me, and I get to carry my father with me wherever I go. And just like that, my secret's not really a secret anymore. See, I've come to see secrets as these ideas of truth that we decide to share amongst our most sacred and respected. And the only reason we as a society think that way is because it reveals vulnerability, something that we fear most about individualism, especially as teens. Okay, so this wouldn't be a family meeting without a family go around first. So my fellow teens in the room, think of your deepest, darkest, most personal truth. Three, two, one. Okay, now look towards the person to your left, and then look towards the person to your right. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Okay, look towards the person to your right and tell them your truth. Three, two, one. Now, I'm willing to bet that most of you did not actually tell the truth, and most of you didn't even do this exercise at all. Why not? It's not because you physically couldn't, or necessarily shouldn't, or you're sworn to some oath of secrecy with some unknown deity, <laughs> no. It's probably because you felt uncomfortable or unsafe, especially because this is high school, where everybody tells everybody everything, where kids will never begin to understand adults, and adults will definitely never begin to understand kids. High school is not meant to be a safe space where you can be yourself, right? And yeah, a year and a half ago, I would completely 100% agree with you on all your thoughts. No space is meant to be safe. But lo and behold, three months later, after writing page after page of bottled up feelings and thoughts and <laughs> sometimes unpopular opinions, I stood upon the Kennedy Center stage which once held legends of the performing arts, such as Cicely Tyson and Yo-Yo Ma, Paul McCartney, Duke Ellington, Tony Bennett, the list goes on and on. Yeah, me, Vuku, all five foot one and a half inches of me, stood upon a stage and spoke my truth into a mic in front of thousands of who, who I now consider family, and everyone listened, including the adults. Now, as I deem this space a safe space for not just me, but every other teen in the room, adults, this talk is not for you to judge nor critically analyze. This talk is for you to listen. And when I say listen, I mean actually listen. Now, let's talk about some ways in which you don't sometimes listen. And this is, this is revealed through the adult unconscious belief of these teenage archetypes, which fall into two main categories. The first is the angsty teen, in which adults perceive that teens are mad at the world and have all these things they need to grow, but continue to have these relentless issues with everyone else as if the world is all their own. And these issues that they fight for are worthless to the value of their growth and evolution. The second is the manic teen, or what I like to call the manic pixie dream teen. Yeah, like the term manic pixie dream girl coined by film critic Nathan Rabin, but I don't necessarily believe this term is gender biased. 
And this is where adults see teens as these molds and models for other teens to base themselves upon. Like that one popular kid in class that everybody follows around, or that ever relentless annoying question of, if this person jumped off a bridge, would you do it too? And the, and the problem with these archetypes is not that they themselves are inaccurate, but the way that people perceive and comprehend them are inaccurate. Yes, teens are mad at the world, and yes, sometimes we do blindly follow other teens around who know, even, who know just as little or even less than we do, but us teens hate to admit it, but we're kind of lost here. The terms of finding oneself and frankly figuring it out are things that are seen that can be something that can be eliminated from the growing up equation and not something that we can work through. And this is where the communication between teens and adults break at the seams and teens feel like they have no voice. And this is where spoken word comes in. Now, I know most people, especially teens, feel like poetry is this thing where you have to be a first year graduate student with a focus in grammatical errors to understand, right? No. Surprisingly, we all have something in common with Ernest and Hemingway and Dickinson and Shakespeare and Frost and Baldwin and Hurston and Hughes. <laughs> we all have names, just like them. And we all have the exact same abilities that they had when taking the opportunity to write. We all have opinions and thoughts and feelings that we feel need to be heard that haven't been heard before. Poetry is literally about any and everything. It can be a piece that everyone can empathize with or the most ambiguous piece ever written. And what matters is that it's all your own. Poetry is a piece of you. Your piece is your own piece, your own soapbox to stand upon. Now, I know this sounds like a lot, but what, how you start off with it first is making a safe space, like the makeshift one I've made here. And a safe space is where teens can come in and freely express themselves knowing that what they say and do here stays here. And this involves creating rules and boundaries for that space, including the Vegas rule, what's said and done here stays here, the don't yuck my yum, if I like and love something, and if you don't, that doesn't mean that you have to demean and invalidate it just because you don't. The ouch oops, our own version of I'm hurt and I'm sorry, and honesty. These rules and boundaries are not here to restrict any of the voices in the room, including the adults. These rules are here to create a foundation for open dialogue between teens and adults. Open, open honest dialogue. And this dialogue can be about anything from how their day went to how they feel the current economic policies could affect their growth and place in this country's future. And as this discussion continues, this evolves into their own self-validation through these things called free rights. And they're exactly what they sound like. Kids use points taken from these discussions and write them into their own thoughts of streamed ink consciousness. Now, there's no judgment, so everyone speaks positively about one's piece and validates them. But there's no push or shove to share. Now, I know this seems like a lot to dive headfirst into, but you don't have to be a professional healer to know how to create these spaces. But if you're still a little nervous about it, there are plenty of spaces, especially across this country, where you can go in and experience firsthand the open communication between teens and adults. These include spaces such as Youth Speaks, residing in the Bay Area, DC Youth Slam, of course, from Washington, DC, Urban Word NYC, residing in the ever-beautiful New York City, and my home and safe space, Vox Teen Communications and Atlanta WordWorks, where I can go in, grab a snack, receive some love, and get to writing about my thoughts and feelings. Now, at this point in my talk, I can feel every adult staring at me in the craziest way possible saying, how, I know sharing feelings and communicating is great and all, but how do I get, I know sharing feelings and communicating is great and all, but what about the grades? And we have these sayings in the poetry community, and they go like, it's not about the points, it's about the poem, and listen to the poet. And this means that I know that there's that one kid that's always, that always doesn't want to do the assignment or doesn't really try, but if you can see that kids are honestly trying to communicate with you and share their feelings, there's no reason to grade their work on misspelled words or grammatical errors. And that brings me to my last point. Empathy is not required for compassion or comprehension. 
and teens and adults, for both of you. Just because you haven't gone through a similar situation doesn't mean that you can't come to ter terms with having comprehen comprehension and compassion for somebody. Teens, not all adults are unwilling to listen or help you work things out, but you have to be open to the idea of being open. And adults, just because you think you can't empathize with teens, you can. Just think, you were once a teen too with all the power and fight and ideas and opinions and confusion that this little time on earth could buy you. And don't you wish that there was someone there to listen? Don't you wish that someone was there to map out and work through your journey, mistakes and all? We don't necessarily wish to ask for much. We just want to know if you can hear us. And if you can, are you listening? And thank you for being here and listening today.